When Constantinople fell in 1453, many of the students of science and art fled to Italy. In Italy, they exposed the people to books, art, and the Greek tradition. This was the start of the Renaissance. Welcome back to Church History. Before we dive into today's episode, check out this podcast that I personally recommend. Hey, I'm Joel. Hey, this is Troy. Have you ever thought about how many sermons have never been listened to because they were never recorded because they came out before recordings? On our podcast, Revive Thoughts, we take the roughly 1900 years of sermons and try to bring them back to life. We talk about the history, we talk about the setting, and every week we have a different speaker deliver these sermons for us to listen to once again. So this is your chance to listen to sermons by people like Calvin by people like Spurgeon, by people like Knox, and maybe some people you've never heard of, like Johann Tauler or Alexander White. Let us live and move and have our being and deal with men as if a dying, risen, interesting... See poor Lazarus in his full frightening misery and behind him Christ. The hand cannot alone deliver man. The body must... You can find Revive Thoughts on any podcast app or player that you have and at revivethoughts.com. We hope you learn something new and grow closer to God. During the medieval time period, art pointed everyone away from humanity and toward heaven. The churches all had high towers that drew the eye upward. Inside the church, the art pointed the eye upward to the high ceilings, which were usually painted. The artwork made humans look unhuman, and the eye would always be drawn away from the human and towards the spiritual elements in the paintings. Human life was not seen as valuable, and the peasants were disposable. If you were a peasant, there was really no way out. The peasants or the serfs lived on land and worked that land. They were allowed to keep some of the food, but most of it went to the landowners. The landowners kept some and passed the rest on to those who ruled over them, and so on, until the king received his share. This was called feudalism. The crusades were the first way for peasants or serfs to find a way out of their situation. After the crusades came trade routes with the west, meeting the east. This gave people the opportunity to join a sailing team or to be a merchant. The merchants brought markets, and the cities were soon growing and thriving. People found freedom in the cities, and the world was changing. This is when the idea of humanism started. Humanism embraced human nature and celebrated human achievements. It also tried to blend all forms of philosophy and religious ideas. There was a new love of knowledge and the idea that humans could have control over nature. Mankind was seen as having dignity and worth. This can be seen in the artwork, biblical characters painted or sculpted in the nude or almost nude. This was the combination of paganism and the Catholic Church. Art and architecture also began to draw the eye towards the human or towards nature. Trees and flowers were added to the artwork and people began to look realistic. Art was very important in this time period and it was seen now as valuable, and people saw it as a way of showing that man was created in the image of God. Leonardo da Vinci was an important artist in this time period. He used art to teach science, and he explored nature and painted his discoveries. He pushed the idea of painting what you're observing around you. People were ready to break free from the control of the church. They wanted to think for themselves. The Bible was starting to be printed and people were reading it for themselves and thinking for themselves. We have already talked about Wycliffe and Huss and their followers were part of this idea of thinking for yourself. There was an idea that life could be different, that life should be different. And Christian humanism began to spread as well. Now, this sounds like an oxymoron. However, in this time period, it did have a good outcome. The Christian humanist at that time period believed that Jesus was human 
still God, but human. It also taught that people should be seen as individuals and that each person could have an individual relationship with Jesus. There was a drive for freedom and the importance of being happy. Human rights were born at this time, and Christians were beginning to see the importance of this, especially coming out of the medieval Inquisition and in the height of the Spanish Inquisition. Many of the men and women who were standing up against the church and thinking for themselves were being killed. Others could see this was not right. Human rights were becoming important. With freedom coming to people in the cities, a group of people saw this as a way to become very powerful. The traders started groups called charters and guilds. The leaders of the guilds became very powerful. And it started a new line of work, the bankers. Bank is from an Italian word that meant counter. They literally counted the money to make the town centers operate. This brought into the town the town fairs, the jugglers, the carnivals, the theaters, and the actors. It also brought universities. Up until this point, you could only get an education from the monks. But the universities were run by the free towns and not by the church. Now it's important to know, the universities, they had freedom of thought, but they still respected the church. They were simply not controlled by the church. The banks at this time were run by a family called the Medici. Giovanni Medici was born in the 14th century as a peasant. He was very smart and probably a genius. He developed a bank in a town that was starting to turn into a free town. In 1410, when there was two popes fighting and both claiming to be the pope, Giovanni Medici took sides with the argument. He picked the Roman pope and he used his money and influence to help the Roman Pope win the argument. The Roman Pope was officially named the Pope and he made Giovanni Medici the banker of the church. The Medici family were at the Constant Council, the one that killed John Huss. They became the, perhaps the most influential men in all of Europe. They ordered kings and popes and everyone did their bidding. They gave a lot of money to the arts and it was really their family money that made artwork at this time possible. Florence was the most important city for the Medici family, and much of their money went to the art in the city of Florence. The new churches built at this time had dome-shaped roofs instead of the high towers. This was to change where your eye went. Instead of the eye going upwards towards heaven, your eye was brought back down towards the people in the church. At that time, the Pope was Pope Alexander VI. Alexander was himself from one of the ruling families who were part of the banker system. He had bought his position and also positions in the church for his children. At this time, that was called simoning. After the character in the Bible, Simon, who tried to buy his position in the church. Alexander had many children from many different women and his sons were just as bad as he was. There was even relationships between his son and his daughter. He was corrupt and sinful and controlling. When Columbus found a new route to what he believed was the East, he was captured by Portugal, who claimed his passage was a break in the treaty they had with Spain. Spain and Portugal had been at war with each other, and the treaty they had made said Spain could not travel the waterway for the purpose of trade. When Spain and Portugal could not agree, they went to the Pope, and Pope Alexander was the one to decide that Spain could continue to allow Columbus to travel. We can see from this the power that the church had. The Pope was more powerful than the kings, and the Pope was controlled by the banking families. But there was one man the Pope found out he could not control, and that is our story for today. It was dark. His family had all gone to bed and 23-year-old Savonarola walked out the door with his few belongings. He would say goodbye to his family. He knew they would not approve of what he was doing, but he knew it was what he had to do. Savonarola had finished medical school. His family had plans for him, but they were not his plans. They were not God's plans. God had been calling him to preach. Whenever he talked to his family about preaching, they disapproved. 
He knew God had not called him to medicine. So he walked away from his home that night. He did not look behind him. He left everything to follow God. Savonarola joined the Dominicans. If you remember from our episode of the Inquisitions, this is the order that actually led the Inquisitions. They were an order that were very strict and didn't put up with anything that they considered fluff. Savonarola was sent to Florence, Italy to preach. As he walked through Florence, he was appalled at what he saw. The Medici family controlled Florence, and at that time it was Lorenzo the Magnificent that was the Medici family member that ruled over Florence. He was not technically the ruler of Florence, but as the banker who controlled all the money, he was the ruler. Lorenzo loved to party, and he held huge citywide parties. He loved to host jousting tournaments. There was lots of gambling and drinking and prostitution. Lorenzo also loved art. That had people nude. So he paid for many statues to be made with nudity portrayed as, as normal as possible. So as Savonarola walked throughout Florence, he was met with statues of naked men and women, drunks, prostitutes, and then there was the carnivals. Once a year, Lorenzo would put on carnivals. It was a huge event that everyone in town participated in. The carnival was a celebration of the kingdom of the devil. The carnival would start when someone dressed as the devil would take a seat on the throne. Then fireworks would go off. That was a signal for the parades to start through the town. The carnival would last days and would include knights battling, bullfights, music, art. And the men and women wore masks and dressed in devil costumes. Then came the bridge fight. Two groups of boys would meet. They would stand on either side of the bridge, rocks in hand. They would then walk onto the ridge and begin a rock fight. Picture a game of dodgeball, except with really large rocks. Many boys were killed or severely wounded. As the carnival came to the close, the devil on the throne would stand and make a speech. He would address all of his little devils, those dressed in costumes, and he would promise to return and bring his little devils with him. And with that, the carnival came to a close. Savannah was completely heartbroken by what he saw in the carnival, and he began to preach and call people to repentance. But no one listened. Then one day he realized he was talking the way he'd been trained in medical school. He was not speaking the way normal people spoke. So he changed the way he spoke, and suddenly his audience began to grow. He was not the only one who was disheartened by what was happening in the city, and he wasn't the only one who disproved of the Medici family and their control of the city. Savannarola stood and began to speak. Around him, a large crowd had gathered. I am the hailstorm, the hailstorm that will smash the heads of those who don't take cover. This was a line from one of his sermons. He preached and warned people of the wrath of God that was coming. Savannarola believed that Jesus was going to return shortly and he would find his church corrupt and living in sin. He called for people to repent. He also preached that God was sending a new Cyrus. He preached that the Medici family would leave Florence and God would put a new ruler in their place and that this would be a sign that Jesus' return would be coming shortly. He preached that if Florence changed and turned their hearts back to God, that God would make Florence the new Jerusalem. Then one day, it happened. Charles VIII of France marched into Florence with an army. The Medici family, hearing he was coming, fled the city. Savonarola met with Charles VIII. He told him God had sent Charles to Florence to help bring the people back to God. As a side note, in our episode, Burning Witches, we talked about Joan of Arc and Charles VII. This was Charles VIII's grandfather. Savonarola helped create a peaceful treaty between Charles VIII and the people of Florence. The people were in shock. The Medici family was suddenly gone. They were ruled by France, yet it had all happened so quickly and so peacefully. There would not be the money anymore for the festivals. The drinking, gambling, prostitution, all of that that was fueled by the festivals, suddenly gone. The people saw Savonarola as more than a preacher. He was a prophet. Now the crowds to hear him speak were very large. 
Basically, everyone wanted to hear what he had to say. He called everyone to turn from their sins, to burn their books and artwork that hailed the devil or that betrayed nudity. He called on people to wear harsh clothing and pray and repent. It was the ashes and sackcloth kind of repenting from the Old Testament. People did burn their books and artwork, but not everyone. As the hearts of the people began to turn back to God, they also began to look at Savannarola as more than just a preacher. He was seen as a prophet, and everything he said was as if God had said it himself. Savannarola was just a man, and what we know about human nature is that when they get power, it never really goes well. Savannarola found the young boys who had been part of that rock throwing on the bridge, and he had them all come to the church, and he trained them to be his little army. They would go house to house and preach that Jesus was returning and that people must repent and that Florence must be ready for his return. The boys dressed in long white gowns. They went door to door telling people to repent and preaching to them. Savannarola called them his little angels. Instead of the kingdom of the devil with the little devils, now it's a kingdom of God with the little angels. With the Medici family out of Florence, there was really no setup anymore for a government. So Savannarola created a democratic republic as far as the city was concerned. Although technically Charles VIII was still the ruler, the city was run in a democratic republic style. He also had new banks set up with little or no interest for loans. Overnight, the city had completely changed. The lower class suddenly was equal with the upper class. Those who could afford fancy dresses and makeup and jewelry were afraid to wear any of that in public. The city had become simple, free, equal, Christian, overnight. But there were still people who supported the Medici family and wanted them back, especially the artists. They suddenly had no money for their artwork. Plus, people were burning their artwork. The rich who had been friends with the Medici family were hiding all their fancy clothes and jewelry and art hoping that things would go back to the way they were sometime. The little angels began to enter people's homes, search their homes, and take anything that they thought was worldly. They would take any book that Savannarola didn't approve of. They would take mirrors, artwork that Savannarola didn't approve of, jewelry. They collected them for a giant bonfire. The little angels became a terrifying group of boys. When people saw them coming, they would run and hide. On February the 7th, 1479, in the center of Florence, they had a bonfire of the vanities. Everything the angels had collected were burned in one big giant bonfire. This is a significant day in art history. The bonfire of vanities on February the 7th, 1479. Many of Donatella's art was destroyed on this day. After that day, Savannarola believed that now the city of Florence was ready for Jesus' return, but the church was not ready. He began preaching even harder about the Pope. He called him out as a fraud. He said he was a Simon. He had bought his way into the priesthood and into his position as Pope. He was vile, sexual pervert, fraud. The Pope called Savannarola to come and meet with him. Savannarola sent a letter back saying he was sick and unable to make the trip. Pope Alexander was angry, and he declared that no one in Florence was allowed to take communion. Now, at this point, most people believed that without taking communion, you could not go to heaven. So the people of Florence began to panic. At the same time, a famine came over the city of Florence. And as the people were trying to figure out how to feed their family, a plague came. People called on Savannarola to ask God to take the famine and the plague away. They had repented. They had done everything Savannarola told them to do, and now they were dying, starving. With the unrest in the city, supporters of the Medici family began to rise. They reminded people of all the good times when they had all the food they wanted, and began saying maybe Savannarola wasn't a prophet, maybe he was a fraud. The pro-Medici group began to grow, and soon there was two large fractions in the city, the Medici supporters and the Savannarola supporters. They came up with a way to prove that Savannarola was a real prophet. What they would do is set a large fire and he would walk through the fire. If he lived, he was a real prophet. If he died, he was a fraud. 
So Fanderola refused to take the walk of fire, but one of his supporters agreed to go in his place. The crowd had gathered in the same place where they had gathered for the carnivals and festivals. A fire was lit and a man walked towards them through the crowd and then stopped. The Medici supporters called out, his robe has anti-fire powers. So he was stripped from his robe and began to walk towards the fire. But he stopped again. He was carrying the Eucharist and people believed that it was literally the body of Jesus. You can't go through the fire with the literal body of Jesus. That's blasphemy. And just like that, a fight breaks out. But then, thunder and a crack of lightning. And the rain begins to pour. And the fire went out. And people began to riot. They wanted a fire trial. Savannarola was taken then and brought to prison. In prison, Savannarola is tortured. His arms are tied behind his back and then a rope is tied around his arms. He's hoisted high into the air and hung, then dropped suddenly. His arms are jerked out of their sockets, and then it's repeated. This happens over and over until Savannarola breaks. He says he was not sent from God. He is a fraud. He's brought to a table and told to write his confession, but his arms are so badly injured that he's unable to move them. Someone else writes the confession for him. Then he is brought back into the center of the town. A large stack of sticks have been piled high. He watches as one of his supporters, the one that was going to walk through the fire for him, is taken to the top. A noose is put around his neck and he is hung. But the rope is too long and he doesn't die quickly. He is hanging there, dying slowly, calling out the name of Jesus, and the sticks below him are lit on fire. His body burns and he dies. Then it's Savannarola's turn. He has the same fate. Savannarola dies March 22, 1498. Years later, a young man named Martin Luther finds a book written by Savannarola. And in his room, reading the book, Martin Luther is convicted of his sins and falls to his knees in repentance. But that's a story for a later time. If you enjoyed the story of Savannarola and you would like to hear more, I'm going to post a link below to a podcast called The Truce Podcast, which I love. In that podcast, there's a whole episode about Savannarola. And if you would like to learn more about him, check out that podcast. I'll be back next week. In the meantime, for more podcasts, for more blogs, for videos, check out lordlyseamans.com. 